Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading, and this is the 30th annual Lake Cumberland American Long Rifle Show. To go along with the video from the show, I recorded a little bit of the story shared by those who started the show about how the show started 30 years ago and how it grew to what it is today. You'll be hearing the voices of Mel Hankla, Mike, and Joe Mills. I've been working at Indiana State University and teaching there, and I moved back to Jamestown, Kentucky, which is directly across the lake. If you go up and look over at the Jamestown Marina, I grew up about a mile and a half up on the hill, and the first job that I ever had was cleaning fish. Because at that point in time, the lake was known for its spoonbill catfish, uh, and the, the fishing industry, the commercial fishing industry was, was I mean, it was huge. But I learned, my father, we had an ever boat leader, boat motor dealership and a hardware store. And my father had learned that, had a friend that knew that the row, the eggs of the spoonbill catfish, was freshwater caviar. So what I was doing is I cleaned fish, I would save the the guts of these other good people's fish that I was cleaning, telling them that I was going to use it to chum a drop line to catch catfish, and I was making more money on the eggs than I was cleaning the fish. But by the time I was 15 years old, I had 15,000 feet of eel net, and I was riding my bicycle down from Jamestown, hitting the boat that was at the dock and going out on this lake. So this is home to me, and it was home for years and years. Um, and I you know, grew up here, and it's just it's really wonderful. This is one of the only times that I come back to Jamestown is for this show. Mike Mills, where's Mike? <laughs> Mike and I had talked, I don't remember, you may remember more than I do, but they wanted to come to my house. I was been working on a log house. Uh, it was in a state of uh, construction, and he wanted to come down, set up the blacksmith forges, and us have a hammer in. And that was planned, and it was planned for the first weekend of February, which would have been in, in what, 94. Uh, on Wednesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, I bet some of you remember the ice storm. It literally shut Kentucky down. Uh, I lost 32 trees in my yard, one had fallen on the house, the electric was gone. So I called Mike and I said, this time, you know, we got we to reschedule this, I can't do it. And uh, we belonged it on the, on the phone for a few minutes. He called me back in an hour. He said, I've talked to everybody. We're going to be down there in the morning. I woke up the next morning with chainsaw in front. And these guys were working on cutting the trees out of my driveway. I couldn't get a car out. I mean, uh, my driveway was completely cluttered. But by the time that we got all the trees out, we set up the blacksmith's porches. We, you know, my shop was dark, it was back in the basement, there wasn't any windows, but we started the blacksmith for them. And they started making knives. We started making tank forks and all of these different things. But it was a wonderful thing, and, and it warmed up. In the middle of the day, it warmed up, so we took saw horses, was working on the house, took two four by eight sheets of plywood, set them out in the driveway, and had a show in front. Most of the stuff was by either Frank House, Social House, or Willie Watt. The vast majority of the stuff that was laid out there for a show and tell. And, you know, I may take the microphone back for a few minutes, but Mike, give him your rendition of this. I mean, he said that he lost a lot of trees, and we didn't realize how many trees he actually lost. So we decided to head on down anyway, as Mel said. We stopped by our farm, he was about three chainsaws in, a whole bunch of he heard chainsaw. So we literally cut our way a half mile in to just get this driveway. <laughs> so we started chainsawing in and finally got in, as Mel said. But one of the things that evening, we worked really hard all that day, got in. But the, the thing that I remember the most is that Mel had taken some of his collection up from the bottom, from his basement. We had our, a lot of our good stuff that we brought out, and we set a lot of it out on a big round table up in his um, break room at that time. And he just had a big table over in one corner with a bunch of chairs, and it was pretty much he was trying to finish the floor, and he just threw sand out, and his kids running around on sand trying to finish the floor out. <laughs> Literally, so we kind of sweep that up, but we had a big fire in the floor. 
stone fireplace, and he had candles on the table. He started talking about the history of Kentucky, the long rifle culture, what that meant then. And it struck me that this same conversation happened hundreds of years ago, the same time, similar circumstances. And there we were trying to reinvest, <laughs> trying to reinvent something that happened years ago. Um, it was a fabulous weekend. At that time, I was trying to start building a few guns, some of them over here. I never charged for free guns because I always just built them for the kids and our families and friends to try to get things started and some of the other guys. Um, but I was trying to fix it learn how to do the hands on the pack box. And I had that down and I threw up all the stuff I had. And I think I threw up most of the nails that, you know, used up all his material. He broke every drill bit I had. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That is true. But we I had a hell of a time doing it. <laughs> so I'm going to let Joe talk a little bit now and kind of tell his side of the story. But anyway, We'll, we'll get back to the, how we ended up starting this. In my defense, I had never worked because we didn't have any power. I was trying to work with the brace and bit. And that's why I broke all of the drill bits, but I was not good at the brace and bit. Kept pulling in at the angles and kept coming out different. And, and we just had a, a lot of memories of this show. So I'm glad to be back here. I haven't been here for a few years. And it's been nice to see everybody, and, and it's just a wonderful thing. And I'm glad it got started the way it did. So, with chainsaws in my hands. Good times. <laughs> so, I knew that this is going to kind of evolve into the storytelling thing. The first thing that I forgot to say a while ago, or maybe I said it earlier, but Brenda Heimel, that was supposed to come and do a, a, a talk on in pottery, Kentucky pottery and antique pottery. I actually think it, it was better. You know, I think there's so many of you here that really don't understand how all of this stuff starts. And in a lot of ways, it's almost like a family reunion. You know, I haven't seen Joe in a long time. I guess the CLA uh, and Mike the same way a lot of times. This would be the only time in the year being I had moved here or moved to Indiana. It's about three hours, you know, the, where they live. Um, there's so much about that weekend that I think back, though, you know, it's like I had her dogs at the time, and I really, I wanted to pull together like a slideshow, because there's some pictures somewhere of the trees falling. Uh, I had, like, barrels, whiskey barrels that I was using as dog houses, and some of them were this high off the ground, where the, the, the wind, or the ice, and rode these trees up, up in the air. Um, Mike was the serious one. He was really working on the gun, working on these hinges. And I walked in my shop, and there was broke drill bits everywhere. You know, I don't know what he was doing. I never asked. But the wonderful thing about that is, on Sunday afternoon, the electric come back on, and we all breathed a sigh of relief. But it was almost a sad thing because we kept the houses alive. We kept the two big cooking fireplaces burning brightly. We had all the bedding lamps burning. We lost count of what forty-five or fifty gallons of coffee that we made. You know, over the fireplaces. The freezer was out, so we was cleaning the freezer out. I mean, we were fantastic. It was like having this, this wonderful rendezvous. And we, of course, started planning right then uh, to do this again. We made the plans, and the second year, we had it back at the house. And it, it started a hammering. It really started a, a, a setting up. Rick Guthrie, who's now deceased, was a blacksmith at Columbia Williamsburg. He started coming on Monday, and we actually had blacksmithing classes for five days before the show. Uh, the third year, we rented, everything got too big for the house, so we needed places for people to stay. So the third year, we rented the lodge at Jamestown, and there was a room maybe a third of this size. And, you know, everybody left the house, and I think I took a shower right quick, but by the time I got there, it was a gun show. It was full. I mean, it, it was fantastic. So I think we, we had it there at least two years. I know David and Jane Wright that are here, uh, Jane still screams every once in a while she thinks of weather because they were coming to my house and heading over a hill and kind of missed the driveway. It was, it was icy and slid. So, so it 
through the years, you know, we've had icy weather and we had to cancel this thing three years ago, and then you've got this, you know, 60 degrees, you know, shirt sleeve weather. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So it's just continued. Every year we've built, I think probably the fourth year is when we come here. So I think, I first thought it was 27, but I think this is 26 years that we've had the show in this room. Uh, it's evolved. We we had to say goodbye to an awful lot of good friends that we've had through the years that was so much a part of the of the beginning of this event. And to see the crowd that we've had this weekend, you know, for this 30th anniversary, and to see you all stay and, and be a part of this camaraderie, I, I know the long rifle culture is alive and well and it's going to continue to grow. And we're all going to continue to nurture these kids. So Joe, more? Everybody did not. Uh -oh. well, so I think it was the second or third year at your house, maybe the last time we were there. Somebody gave mail a bunch of buffalo tongues. And we're going to cook these things. Well, we didn't know how to cook the buffalo tongues. And he had some old local boys up there that had a smoker or something. And we're going to cook these things. Well, they showed up and got the thing running and going, and they put them up on there. And they cooked them, and they cooked them, and they cooked them. We'd go sample them. It was like chewing shoe leather. <laughs> and they never got any better. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We just we worked. We didn't we didn't do our homework real good on it. So that's when we figured out about the pizza place up here in the turn of the road. <laughs> And that's some of the best pizza we ever had. I guarantee you. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, folks, thanks for being a part. Thanks, thanks for, for coming for every year. Uh, it's just wonderful to have you here.
this wire where a slit is cut in the wood. The slit that you cut in the wood is kind of angled. This is the first time I've been able to attend this particular show. I've tried to go now for several years, but it seems like the weather up north here where I'm at doesn't want to cooperate or the Kentucky weather doesn't want to cooperate. I was excited to finally 
get down to Lake Cumberland this year, brought the whole family and uh, really had a great time the entire weekend. This is a fantastic location for this kind of event. You're off the beaten path in the center of a state park. You don't have the hustle and bustle of the city or even a town really that many other long rifle shows have across the country. It gives it a really special ambiance. You can see through the back window of the small hall where all the tables are set up, a beautiful view of Lake Cumberland and here in kind of early, early spring, we saw some signs of spring coming around the corner, but it was just a really peaceful, serene weekend here, looking at gorgeous American long rifles and their accompanying accoutrements in such a beautiful location. That's really second to none. This is a relatively small show compared to some of the other long rifle or muzzle loading events that we've covered here on the channel. They have 65 tables, but those 65 tables are full of some fantastic pieces and examples of both original and contemporary muzzle loading. If you can, I absolutely recommend trying to get out to this show. For me, it was the first event I was able to travel to for this year, and it really kicked off uh, the year, I think. I'm really excited to get back on the road, see some other folks, see some other work, and hang out with the muzzleloading community. I'll have several still photos in the blog post at ilovemuzzleloading.com to accompany this video, so if you'd like to see some of the more particularly interesting pieces up close and still images rather than the video of everything moving around, you can check those out again at ilovemuzzleloading.com. I'm going to do my best to add this show to my yearly roster not just because of the people or the event location, but just because of the ambiance or the vibe really that this event had. It was so laid back, so casual, but it was still just a wonderful event. I really encourage you, especially if you're new to the hobby, the sport or the community in general, check out an event like this or this event next year. I think it would serve as a great introductory event for somebody to dip their toes in, get a taste for what this can be like without bumping shoulders all weekend at one of the larger events. I don't mean to gush, I just had a great time. My wife and my baby had a great time. Uh, just a really fantastic event. Thank you, Mel, and thank you to everybody else who participates in this event, tabling and helping set up and tear down. Really had a great time. Once again, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time.